This is the third and final video in my series about modeled and computer assisted training. When I first put these up, I said there would be four parts instead of three, but I decided to eliminate one because there wasn't enough substance there. What material I have there, I'll work into a later lecture. This is the one I think you'll find most interesting. This is the one about the Bayesian Monte Carlo horse racing model. And so let's start telling that story. So as it says here, your teacher, Alvi Thacker and others of the Palm Island traders believe that there are endless opportunities in under the radar computer assisted trading. Lack of liquidity and or very limited profit opportunities keep large traders away from a large segment of these markets. We know that market makers are found everywhere in the market making activity, but there's a lot of trading that does not involve market making. Would Citadel be interested in a trading strategy that could make a little more than $18 per day? Probably not. But would you if it could be automated? A lot of these trades do not lend themselves to economies of scale. A lot of these trades are only possible in 100 share or 200 share blocks or single option chains, or single option contracts, I should say, and are more suitable for a nimble small trader or the small trading team than for large firms. So where did all this nonsense start for me? Well, this is a story of Fortran, which was spelled with all caps back then, even though it's not, of IBM System 360 batch processing computers, which we had to use using key punch cards when we first started, although it was transitioning right at that time to the very first interactive terminal-based computers. And so we had a Prime 95 that we could use toward the tail end of this. And everybody was dazzled by the fact that you could use a keyboard and a terminal at a computer <laughs> at the time. Uh, of course, monochrome monitors and no images, but we didn't have to use punch cards and that was nice and a couple of graduate students at UC Riverside with very little money and a great big model. And so this is a lecture that I've always entitled A Bayesian Approach, the Fortran Horse Racing Model Vintage 1978. And the one takeaway that I want you to understand about this, which is why we're calling it a Bayesian model, this is a story about getting an edge. This is a story about and getting an edge. Now, the person who really wrote the model is Gary Langer, uh, who's pictured up here. It appears that he's still at the um, uh, Rochester University in Chicago at the College of Arts and Sciences. He's still listed on the faculty there. And he's older than I am, so he'd be in his late 70s, I would guess, by now. And he started Fortran a little earlier than I did, and he learned uh, Monte Carlo simulations a year before I did. And so he wrote pretty much all of the model, explained it to me, and after that I understood the model. I knew how to write it in Fortran at some point. But I was mostly tagging along in at least the first year as we were doing this, although I was making suggestions on the modification of the model. Now this is kind of an interesting story because for research this was really a lot of fun. This was conducted at horse racing tracks, especially at Santa Anita, which isn't very far from Riverside and is even closer to uh, Harvey Mudd. Now, back in the 1970s and 80s, horse racing was a huge industry. The horse races were very popular. The stands were packed every weekend, at least, not necessarily through the week. And Santa Anita was the crown jewel of horse racing on the West Coast, at least. An absolutely beautiful facility. It's very sad for me to see that now in 2020, there's a lot of controversy because there's been a number of deaths at the track, horses having to be put down. And I don't recall that was ever a problem back in 1978, 1979, 1980, although it, it may have been, it may have been that uh, it just wasn't publicized back then. If you ever want to watch a comedy, a movie that really, I think, captures the, at least the culture of horse racing. It doesn't tell you anything about the betting, not very much about the betting. 
The movie Let It Ride in 1989, made in 1989 with the Richard Dreyfuss, is a really funny movie. And I watched it again recently, and I said, yeah, I remember <laughs> that's the way it was. I mean, what he does in this movie is not something people did very much. But the, as you can see here, this sort of sense of anxiety and desperation and excitement at the track. That happened even if you're running a model. And uh, this basically is the, this picture could be of Gary Langer and me, actually. <laughs> because we would stand at the rail and we really wanted the horses to win. We, um, as I'll describe in a minute, we formally bet on the model. But we kept the money for the model separate from other betting money because we had to sit there during the day. We also bet on uh, regular races uh, for various reasons and uh, kept the results separate from the model. Let me tell you a little bit about what the model did, okay? So when Langer approached me this, and this was, I think, 1978. I'm not even sure about that. I used to keep records of this in my office at Harvey Mudd. And But the records were printed on this high acid paper, basically uh, like the American Racing Forum, and, the, and they just actually literally disintegrated. And so uh, very little remains of that except some of the logs that we kept. So Gary Langers came to me and said, I've written a, a program in Fortran that does Monte Carlo simulations of six furlong races using data from the American Racing Forum to estimate the probability of wins. And even though computers were very slow then compared to where they are now, we were using a big mainframe at the, at the start at least, an IBM System 360. So I would dutifully punch out on punch cards all of the data taken from the American Racing Forum, and we would submit it as a batch process down at the machine room at UC Riverside, and we would get back an estimate of the probability of a win for each horse based upon about 10,000 simulations of each race. I remember that 10,000 simulations was the standard that we kept. And it probably took a few minutes to run 10,000 simulations on the computers of that time. We can, of course, as you know, do this now instantaneously on your laptop. You may not know what this means, but the kind of horse that we bet on only were claimers. Now, claimers uh, uh, is a well-established horse with a racing history. And for the races, uh, we had to have enough of a track record for every horse in the race to be able to do the Monte Carlo simulation. So we didn't bet on maiden races, for example, and maiden races where the horse in the races never won a race. We didn't bet on races when horses were just starting out and had two or three uh, races, even if one of those was a victory. And we didn't... Uh, uh, bet on typically on the big handicap race, the event of the day where races were coming from the outside and their stats were not comparable. This picture here shows the toot board at Santa Anita Park, which shows the odds at the top that I'll be talking about in the minute. In a minute, the horse three, for example, is rated at 25 to one, horse four is 21 to one, horse five is 11 to one, horse six is 20 to one, and the like. And so that's the basis for the gambling. And the picture in the upper uh, right corner is Clocker's Corner at Santa Anita. Anybody who's ever been to Cl uh, Santa Anita knows where Clocker's Corner is. It's kind of off to the corner of the racetrack, away from the main stands. And it's where people go in the morning to have breakfasts before the races start, typically hours before the races start, as the horses are going through their training and their workouts. And most of the people there are eating scrambled eggs and sausage and sitting there with the racing form and all kinds of pencils and pen and trying to figure out who they're going to bet that day based upon anticipated odds. It really was a lot of fun. Now, as I said, we use the American or the Daily Racing Forum. I think it was called the American Racing Forum. This is a version of the Daily Racing Forum uh, from May the 2nd, 1957. That, that front looked like that still in the 1970s and 1980s. And so you would buy that from a nearby liquor store. It was sold all throughout uh, Southern California. It had these general articles about horse racing on the front. It covered every race in the United States. Somewhere in that would be Hollywood Park and Santa Anita. And so the data that we used is typical of what you're looking at right here on one horse called Roll Edit Roll, horse number one, right? So this is six furlong races. And so you can see there's about, I don't know, 10 or 12 or so um, 
races that this horse has already won. And the st stats there show how they did at each post uh, as one furlong, for example, and second furlong. And of course, uh, how they finished uh, when uh, second place or third place. And it has the winnings up in the top. Now, the only data we used on this was actually the uh, time it took to run the six furlongs. We didn't use post data. Gary thought about trying to stick it in there, uh, but it was too much work at that time. So we just, we just actually took the uh, length of the six furlong race and calculated its mean and standard deviation for the largest part. And that was the basis for on Monte Carlo simulation. So you say to yourself, well, that doesn't sound very sophisticated. That could not have worked. That's not enough information. Very small sample set, large error, obviously. Um, this isn't going to be a program that, that works. And of course, that was our skepticism, too. We knew all of these limitations, right? You have like 12 observations, not a thousand, and you're doing Monte Carlo simulations. But uh, you can adjust for that to some extent. And besides, it's determined by results, not your prior theory. So, uh, when we made the calculation, the odds that we calculated are equal to the inverse of the probability minus one. Uh, so, for example, so we started by estimating the uh, frequency of wins in the Monte Carlo simulations. So, if in ten thousand simulations, uh, the the horse won, uh, say a uh, thousand of them, then the odds were nine to one, because the probability would be ten percent and the odds are 1 over the probability minus 1. So for the example I give here, if you have a 25% probability, then that means that the horse wins one time in four and loses three times in four, so it's 3 to 1 are the odds. As I say, the inverse of the probability minus 1. And the racetrack tote boards list the odds determined by betting frequencies of people who make the bets. And that is adjusted for what is called the track handle, which is 18% uh, of the amount bet. So the amount the track takes out just to process the bet, 18%, really makes this kind of a crummy gambling game. You know, some of the uh, odds in Las Vegas are as bad as that, but only for the worst type of gambling. Uh, odds for blackjack and things like that are consistently above um, 90%. The casino only takes out 6 or 7%. Uh, maybe takes out 12% for certain slot machines for unsophisticated gamblers. For video slots, for example, they only take out 6 or 7%. So taking out 18% is quite a lot. So on the previous slide, when I showed you the odds, then that meant that uh, that horse's odds were 20 to 1. So most of the horses in the race had very high odds, but there were a handful in the range that had 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 8 to 1, 12 to 1, and the like. And then, of course, there was a favorite who might be 2 to 1 or even 3 to 1, but as often as not, it was 6 to 5 or something like that. A really strong favorite who uh, really won. The pictures, I mean, who really, who won most of the time. The pictures here are of Del Mar down in the bottom. You can see Del Mar's close to the ocean, and that was really a lot of fun to go to. But we didn't go very much. It's a long drive, but we did. And then Hollywood Park, which uh, I didn't like Hollywood Park very much. It was kind of a run-down track compared to Santa Anita, uh, or a run-down facility, I should say. It was absolutely enormous. Um, the, they closed in 2013, so, and they tore the track out. So we went to all three, but almost, uh, I would say, 90% of our bets were at Santa Anita. And we only went maybe three, four, five times a week. We went more days than we did not uh, to Santa Anita. And we were lucky because we were both teaching assistants at the time, but we had evening courses and all the courses that were taught that we had to take. Although at that time, uh, he was working on his dissertation, I think, and I was pretty close to that. So we didn't have to work in the morning. So we would do our teaching in the evening or whatever we had to do to make money in the evening. And uh, I taught, for example, at uh, Riverside City College. It was a great job teaching Riverside City College. Then we would go get the racing form at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And we would do the data and I would punch it. And we would take it to the machine room, and we get done like 3 a.m. sometimes. I mean, this really went a long time. Then we would get up at 7, uh, 
and drive to the track to be at Clocker's Corner by 8 or 8.30. And the races wouldn't start for another couple of hours because we had to make sure we understood the betting strategy. As it turns out, um, we maybe bet on three or four races per day. Uh, not all of them. Uh, only three or four races per day. And there's a, the, the day typically had, I think, nine races. And so uh, we only bet on three or four because the betting conditions had to be best. Now, the before I tell you the strategy, we kept meticulous records of the results. Every bet we made was a win bet, and every bet was a $2 bet. We didn't have any money back in those days. We, every bet was a $2 bet. It didn't matter what the size of the bet was. They, they took 18% of $2, they take 18% of $2,000. So you got the same return on a small bet as you did on a, a large bet. And we were mostly doing this for statistical reasons anyway. It turned out that over the, uh, the about year and a half or two years that we did this, the, we made 2% on a rate of return on our investment. And you say to yourself, you made 2%. That's not very impressive. Keep in mind that the track took out a handle of 18%. So effectively, our rate of return was a 20% rate of return. And that actually is quite impressive. We were mostly just playing the game to learn the game. You know, I, we had no grand illusions about making a lot of money at the horse races. I, although I'd like to try this model out again. Uh, someday. So what was the strategy? Well, we uh, we did not bet to win. We did not, for example, bet that the horse that won the simulation the most times, that had the highest frequency of wins, would win. We never once placed a bet on a winning, on a horse that was favored uh, because that wasn't the strategy. We tried to find a mismatched betting. We tried to find examples where the tote board, which had the odds, showed the odds typically for the horse uh, winning as much higher than our simulation did. So the bet that we would place is if we went to the track, say on the fourth race, it's a claimer race. If the track said it's seven to one and our program gave it a 25% frequency at three to one, that's the horse we would bet. Now keep in mind, if you make that bet, even if your model is perfect, if it's got it exactly right at three to one, you're actually betting that you'll only win one race in four if you're betting at those odds. And so, of course, you're placing a bet in a gambling situation where you expect to lose the bet well more than 50% of the time. In this example I gave, 75% of the time. And we would place sometimes more than one bet in a race. That wasn't that rare, actually, because some of the really high odds horses might be uh, at 25 to 1 on the track, and our model would have it at 13 to 1. And we would rarely, but now and then, win one of those. And so, of course, that helped out quite a bit, too. So basically, we were betting about the track having anomalies, and not properly betting on the odds for whatever reason that might happen. We always factored in mud, which is to say uh, there are mud horses that run very well on rainy days. And that, that was kind of raining a lot back in those years, so uh, we we went to a lot of rainy day races. So we did factor in mud. We, we uh, used, I think they called it Tobit analysis, that allows you in a regression. So we did some regressions in the background that... Uh, allow you to regress uh, continuous numbers against a key variable that is binary, for example, so mud, not mud. And uh, at the very end, we were factoring in other externalities as well. And the most robust was the trainer externality to uh, give a value to a trainer that we thought, again, it was Boolean for the largest part, good trainer, not so good trainer. And I remember that we always gave a one as opposed to a zero. I think this is how we did it. I'm not, I don't quite remember to a trainer named Whittingham, who uh, we knew from our own betting that uh, he had a knack for winning at Santa Anita. We concluded statistically that the jockey choice didn't matter. It was the case that many of the more famous jockeys like Shoemaker 
uh, would win a much higher percentage of the races, but that's because they were put on the best horses, uh, not because you could tell statistically that they actually had a, an edge over the lesser jockeys. So as I say, we uh, ended up having a really great time, and we ended up actually getting a 2% return on an, on an 18% handle after all this time had passed. I don't, I'm not sure anymore. I don't remember how many races we bet on, but even betting on three per day, it was a few hundred races. And we were convinced that the model, as primitive as it was, was better than simply the cold calculus of people, horse race fans, and the common public going to the track and just sort of betting for whatever reason they bet. Again, another reason to uh, possibly watch that movie. So the point of this, though, is that the kind of betting we did was unconventional. It wasn't a bet on a win. And that's kind of the nature of the betting, for example, that we often do at options. We are looking for anomalies, and we bet those anomalies if something is mispriced according to a model we're using. And you may have noticed by now already that that's kind of what we do, or that's the logic of what I'm talking about when we, when we talk about this stuff. And we go back to the point of the slideshow to begin with, what I said is this kind of activity, as crude and as primitive as that model was, nonetheless gave us an edge over people who were not using any models at all. And that's, I think, what you have to come to expect out of a very good model that you develop. It just gives you a slight edge on things, and you Possibly you're engaging in a strategy where the number of times you lose far exceeds the number of times you win, but that's not important. Uh, if the wins that you make when you do win are sufficiently large to offset the multiple losses when you lose, that's all that matters. Basically, the expected value of the whole betting chain has to be a little bit larger than the cost of making all the bets. And if you can find the anomalies that make that happen, then you have a winning model of a particular kind. It's largely a Bayesian kind. I can't make that claim directly about being a Bayesian climb kind. So uh, I'm not requiring you to do this. I'm, I'm suggesting to you that you would benefit a lot from doing this after the class is over and maybe even after you graduate. Take a look at Bayesian theory and take a look at the Bayesian uh, inference because that's the kind of approach I'm actually uh, using here. And you'll note on our literature page that I have this uh, section that says all things Bayesian. And I say if you don't understand the Bayesian approach by now, it's time to get started. I'm fundamentally a Bayesian. I'll explain that a little bit more in class later. Uh, and I also have here, in memory of MUD professor Stavros Busenberg, who is a, a world-renowned Bayesian theorist, I have here the first thing listed is his research archive, which has been published when he was at MUD between 1988 and 1997. He died tragically, uh, prematurely, and would probably still be alive. I think he wasn't much older than I am. And uh, it was really a shock when he died. He used to sponsor these big Bayesian conferences on the campus. And the world-renowned figures of chaos theory and the like were all over Harvey Mudd about every other year or so when these conferences went on. It was really something to, to, to participate in. Of course, two-thirds of the time, I didn't know what they were talking about. I wasn't that far advanced in the mathematical side of Bayesian theory. But uh, I did understand some of it. And uh, I sort of got the perspective on all of it, I think. I also recommend that you look at these first two videos sometime. This is by Kristen Lennox of Lawrence Livermore Labs. And the first one is about the difference between Bayesian theory and traditional statistical inference. And the second one is simply directly about Bayesian theory and its approach to probability. And it's very easy to understand. I think it's, uh, if you don't want to read a bunch of stuff, then look at those two videos. Uh, and then um, there's a number of, of books about uh, Python and Bayesian theory, and uh, some of these are listed there, and you can look at these later. There's one here that I want to give special attention to. You may have seen this in my office. This is the uh, Bayesian Methods for Hackers, and that link up there, this entire book is uh, in PDF for free on the Internet, and it's extremely readable. In fact, they got it in some sort of... Uh, 
a book display type browser setup where you can read it like a book on the internet. This has within it very early on the conditional probability theorem and a Python program that includes that in Python 3. And so I've often said if we wanted to do American style options pricing because they uh, can be sold at any time, you would really have to use the conditional probability theorem to do that. And so you say, well, what the hell is the conditional probability theorem? If you're a mathematician, you will certainly know what it is. Well, you say, well, how do you code it? Not that hard to code if you know the theory, but this book has uh, coded applications. This is a Python book for the largest part. That is application after application after application of uh, Bayesian inference and uh, models that, that coded Bayesian inference. It's really something you need to look into at some point in your life. There is specifically uh, Bayesian linear regression for practitioners is also something that I, I recommend. And uh, this, is, this just came out recently by uh, Max Halford. And this takes a Bayesian approach on linear regression, which is going to be considerably different than what you're uh, used to. And this is also just loaded with code. So if you plan on continuing this uh, kind of research. I've given you a lot of material to sort of look at on your own. I'm also going to talk about a very important book in this tradition, and that's John Maynard Keynes' Treatise on Probability, because that book has a much better conceptual explanation of the Bayesian point of view than any of this stuff has, and it's the book that mostly influenced me in, uh, in my thinking, uh, because I read it for the first time way back in the 70s or 80s. I read it three times now. I taught it once, just taught the book one semester, just that book. And it was pretty cool. It was 1991 or 1992. And I've since read it a third time. But I'll talk about it. I don't want to talk about it here in the video. I'll talk about it later in class. So just kind of remember the core message here. This is the kind of philosophy that I tend to use on the type of investment models that I build. This is the only way to do it, obviously. But, uh, you know, the mean reversion stuff doesn't work this way. The, obviously, StatArm doesn't work this way. The uh, uh, market making doesn't work this way. But this is a good application. Okay, that's it for the series. Now the videos will start getting back to uh, the core theory.